I want to welcome other people who are logging on right now. I appreciate you being here tonight. We'll, we will start, um, you know, promptly at 630. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this screen and let us go ahead and get going. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Kelly, and I'm going to be um, kind of moderating the conversation tonight. Um, but really, to get us started, I'd like to welcome the president of the League of Women Voters of Indianapolis, Rhea Kane. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Erin. Um, sharing this screen. And let us go ahead and get going. Oh, no. No, it's fine. We have the Facebook lags behind the um, Zoom, so you need to turn off the Facebook. Let me turn off the sound. I thought the sound was off. I am so sorry, everybody. Zoom. <laughs> Zoom. So thank you, Erin. Um, I'm glad people are on tonight. And uh, thank you all for being here, especially to our panelists. Um, if you didn't catch the slide uh, in the loop, the we the League of Women Voters of Indianapolis are celebrating our hundredth year of helping folks in Indianapolis and Marion County figure out the process of voting and how it all works and how to be civically engaged and connected within your community. So it's important tonight that we brought all these folks together to kind of answer the questions that folks have about rights pertaining to voting. And so just to jump right in, we'll go ahead and introduce our attendees, I'm sorry, our panelists. Erin, um, as she mentioned, will be moderating. She's with the League of Women Voters of Indianapolis. Um, and the rest of our uh, panelists, I will go in, it looks like alphabetical order. Thanks, Erin. <laughs> oh, Autumn Carter. Uh, it, Autumn is a native resident of Indianapolis and she is the mother of one. She attended Purdue University and majored in legal studies. She's since kind of ventured into the political and legal arena um, professionally and in um, a volunteer capacity. In 2017, she was the finance director of the Marion County Democratic Party. Um, and in 2018, Andre Carson uh, sent Autumn to study with the Congressional Black Caucus. And they look at things um, that we actually, as the league, really are interested in, gerrymandering, uh, redlining, and how these impacts, <clears throat> I'm sorry, these issues impact uh, our community. Uh, in addition, she's worked part-time in voter registration as a clerk. Uh, she's a strong advocate for voter rights and protection. And she currently works uh, at Ice Miller, working in public affairs directly making sure that campaign uh, campaigns are compliant uh, with finance with like those sorry I, I jumped a line <laughs> that are compliant she's the current director of diversity and inclusion for the Indiana Young Democrats and she is also uh, on their executive board she's also the current treasurer for the Marion County coroner Lee Sloan and she's the pre uh, she has served as a precinct committee person for Washington 40 prior to relocating to Lawrence Township earlier this year. Autumn, I don't know how you have time <laughs> to do much of anything else. You're a very busy lady. Our next uh, panelist is Jane Henniger. Jane has served as the exec executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Indiana since 2012. In this role, she leads the state ACLU affiliate in its work to defend individual rights and enhance and preserve liberties that are guaranteed by the U.S. and Indiana constitutions and civil rights laws. Uh, during her tenure, the ACLU of Indiana has grown to 12 employees and has more than doubled its members and supporters in Indiana. Prior to her service with the ACLU, she served as the deputy mayor of Indianapolis under Bart Peterson from 2000 to 2006. Uh, she has held various positions in government, including st state director in the office of Senator Evan Bayh, deputy commissioner and general Council in the Indiana Department of Administration, Executive Post at the Family and Social Services Administration, and Judicial Law Clerk for the Honorable Thomas Revely, United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. She's a born and raised Hoosier. 
Uh, she grew up on a farm in southern Monroe County and is a graduate of Bryn Mawr College and Indiana University Mauer School of Law in Bloomington. So welcome, Jane. Thanks. Thank you for Thanks being for having here. Me. And our next panelist, and um, certainly not last, uh, but last panelist I'll be discussing this evening, is Catherine Best. And she's originally from New Orleans, and she moved to Indiana after Hurricane Katrina hit her hometown. Once here, she earned her bachelor's degree in criminal justice from IUPUI. Uh, she's worked with numerous community service groups and nonprofits on election-related initiatives um, before becoming a communication, yeah, communication and outreach specialist with Indiana Disability Rights. In this role, she's able to continue her passion for working on advocacy and election initiatives for people with disabilities with the goal of increasing engagement in the electoral process and improving Hoosiers' quality of life. In her spare time, she is an avid endurance sports enthusiast. She has completed several running races and triathlons, including participating in the Ironman Triathlon in 2016 and completing an unofficial half Ironman last summer. Welcome, Catherine. We should have you run with my husband. <laughs> he's, a, he's also a marathoner. So thank you so much for having me. I'm, we're so glad you all are here. And at this point, I'm going to turn the conversation back over to Erin, and she's going to get this program rolling. And But thank you all for participating this evening. We very much appreciate it. All right. Welcome again, everybody. Thank you um, again for being here to all of our panelists. Uh, every person on this panel is incredibly busy with their day job. And then with the election on top of it, I know everyone is pressed for time. So we are really grateful to you all for taking an hour, hour and a half out of your evening today um, to talk about voting rights. So just thank you, very grateful for that. And I'm grateful to everyone who has logged on uh, both in Zoom and Facebook. Uh, our goal this evening is really to help you gain some more knowledge, um, gain some resource ideas um, so that together we can work to combat, frankly, the fear and anxiety that is surrounding this year's election. We want you, the voters, to feel secure in the voting process. And we believe knowledge is power and that by working together, we can all become our own best advocates for ourselves and for our wider community. So I really want to begin um, big picture. We're gonna talk specifics about Indiana and voting rights that we have here, things we need to know. But I do want to begin big, pic big picture, um, Jane, um, by asking you a few questions. Your job day in and day out is to guard civil liberties, right? Um, what are you seeing right now, big picture in the country and in, in Indiana that's making voting harder um, that, that you're concerned about? Yeah, thanks, Erin. That's a really important question because it's something that we've been worried about as groups like League of Women Voters and other groups across the country have been focused on protecting the right of every person to vote and for every vote to matter. And I think that's really the focus of the, the um, litigation and the advocacy and the education that the ACLU has been um, pursuing for the last man, for this for over a year now, um, knowing that this is going to be an election like no other. And on top of what we already knew was going to be a momentous uh, election is a pandemic, right? So so every year we, um, at, on behalf of voters and the rights of voters, we worry about election laws that, as you know, Aaron, uh, vary from state to state. So how do we get each of those states' laws to make it easier, not harder to vote? And so whether that's voter ID laws, um, management of voter registration, how you register, how those voter rolls are being maintained, um, voting hours, um, you know, absentee mail-in voting, um, all of those are laws that have unfortunately been politicized over the last, especially, well, forever, right? We know to, to whether it's Jim Crow laws in the South, other racially biased laws forever in our country, and then more recently trying to limit the access to the ballot. Then you layer on top of those challenges and, and we've had 27 lawsuits, just the ACLU alone, 
um, this year trying to reduce those barriers to the ballot. And then the pandemic, right? So the pandemic makes it, how do I vote and keep safe? Um, what are those rules of absentee voting and how have they changed with the pandemic, right? I mean, unfortunately, Indiana is only one of five states in the country that has not made it no excuse absentee voting. But those, vote, those rules vary from state to state. We know it's gonna be record turnout. So that's, what does that do for long lines and access to the ballots? And because of the pandemic, are there, um, uh, are there fewer voting sites as there was were in the spring? States like Georgia, where I'm um, so you know, in states like Georgia, were involved in recruiting volunteers to make sure that we can man um, as many voting stations as possible. And then on top of it is the unfortunate heated rhetoric, right? That we know um, elected officials at the highest and lowest level in our country have um, created, as you said, that atmosphere and fear and. I'll tell you whether it's voting rights or any other right, the ACLU, we, that's one of the things we always combat is the chilling effect of rhetoric, right? We can't let um, rhetoric, idle threats, um, uh, fear that the, the election may not be valid, that it's insecure, we have to combat all of those things and make sure first and foremost that it doesn't impede our individual motivation and ability to vote because um, all of those, all, the purpose of that rhetoric is to chill our use of our voices, right? So we have to make sure that we have a voting plan, that we vote as early as possible, in person if possible, um, to combat all the um, efforts. Um, and I know that groups um, like ours, like others all across the nation have been focused on making sure that this is a, a safe election and that we all, every voice will be heard. Thank you. So a lot, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot on your mind. There's a lot on your plate. Um, so, you know, add, add to some concerns this election, um, but there are things we can do as voters. And of course, educating ourselves is, is one of those, those key things. So one of the things, one of the goals that we had, the league had for this evening um, was really to help voters understand their, some of their very specific rights. So folks watching tonight may or may not know, I'm gonna do a little screen share here. Indiana has a, uh, a voter bill of rights. Let me see if I can show that a little bit bigger. This might loop in 10 seconds though, unfortunately. But we have an Indiana Voter Bill of Rights. Um, all you need to do is Google Indiana Voter Bill of Rights and you can pull this up. Now we are not going to go through the Bill of Rights this evening line by line, but for the viewers who are watching, um, I mean, talking with our, our panelists, we're sort of using this as a framework to talk about different issues this evening to make sure that you've got um, all of the information that you need. So I actually want to begin, actually, um, well, not begin, but I'd like to engage the uh, viewers right now at this point, and I want to launch a little poll. So I know we've got uh, 24, 25 people here on Zoom. Um, I want to launch a poll and ask you guys who are watching right now to tell me, tell us which of the following is a false statement. So which is not true? So in Indiana, you have to meet certain requirements to vote, and these are outlined in our Voter Bill of Rights. So which is not a requirement, that you must be a citizen of the US, that you must be a resident of Indiana, that you must have an ID with your address, that you must be 18 by the general election, that you may not currently be in prison, um, that you have lived in your precinct for at least 30 days, and that you must be registered. So if everybody in Zoom land right now, um, this is anonymous, so don't be embarrassed by anything, just click one of those choices which of these is not a requirement to vote in the state of Indiana? I'll give you a few more seconds here, about 10 more seconds. And I am sorry for the folks in Facebook world who can't take, do the poll right now, but we appreciate you being here. 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and show the results. So excellent job, viewers. Um, yeah, you might, the incorrect answer is you must have an ID with your current address. All of the rest are actual requirements that you need to vote in Indiana. So you see, in theory, to vote in Indiana, you have to be a registered 18-year-old living in the state of Indiana at an address tied to your precinct within 30 days of the election, and you can't be in prison. But in practice, we know that isn't true because Indiana has that voter ID law. Um, Autumn, I'm actually going to ask you some of these questions about Indiana's voter ID law because I know you have done a lot of voter registration work in the past. <laughs> Um, so have I. And I know frequently when we do voter registration work, we, you know, you get done registering a voter and then one of the first things you usually ask is, and do you have the proper ID to vote? Correct. So I was wondering if you could share with the audience, um, you know, what is it about Indiana's voter ID law? What are the things that voters really need to know when it comes to the proper kind of ID to take with them to vote? Sure. So they want to make sure that it's government issued. So you can usually use like a passport or um, like an ID from in, from the state of Indiana. Um, just anything with the, that's government approved. So you can't use like your work ID. Um, and then just making sure that the expiration date is no, um, it's not past, I'm gonna say two days after or three days after the election. Um, so you want to make sure that it's current. Um, just, I always tell people to make sure that it doesn't expire on the day of, um, just to put people at, at ease. Well, actually, the, the, just to clarify, the expert, it can't be in, expired any older than the last general election. So that would be um, November 6, 2018. Okay. So, we, so yeah. So we so actually, I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, you please. Yeah. So I usually tell people just to make sure that it's, um, that it's current. Um, just so I know I have stated that to people before and they're like, are you sure? Yeah. So I just always tell them that's why I have brought that point up just to make sure that it doesn't expire past, um, I mean, sorry, it, doesn't expire a little bit past um, the election day only because again, people ask, are you sure? Um, so to give them peace of mind, I just always give them that tidbit. Um, I'd also make sure that it has a current photo or just like a photo of yourself on it. Um, so you can't use anything like, um, again, something that does not have a picture on it. Um, and then also I would just make sure that it has your name on there, your current name. So if you've been married, remarried, make sure it's current. Can you talk a little bit though about the name? Because the law is very specific that the name must conform. And I know at the league, we sometimes get questions because people think they can't vote because you know, they're, they're, the name on the voter registration is Elizabeth, but the name on their driver's license is Beth. So can you clarify what that means, like the whole conforming? Sure, so I would just make sure that it matches your voter registration. So whatever you put on your voter registration, make sure it matches. Um, so that way it can, there's no questioning or you would have to fill out a provisional ballot to um, to basically combat that. But it is the voter's right to vote with an ID that the name that conforms. So if it's a reasonable Correct. nickname, really, um, that's, so I think that's important for voters to know that, that they can stand up for themselves and say that, no, John is a reasonable nickname from Jonathan. Right. My name is valid, yeah. Right. Now, is there anything in particular that you've encountered regarding um, folks that you're registering to vote or voters um, and their questions about voter ID that you think, we've had the voter ID law for 15 years, but it still confuses people. What do you see that, that confuses people quite a bit? I would definitely say the address. Um, so that was one of the questions in the polls and I'm so happy that you brought that um, to everyone's attention because I know a lot of people will make a point that they've moved since they um, have completed their voter registration form. And I just let them know that that does not need to be current in order to vote. So I think that's something that does trip people up a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's why we include it in the poll because I have, when, nothing makes me, well, a lot of things make me very sad around election time, <laughs> but I hate it when I hear it after the election, somebody tell us I didn't vote because my address was, was you know, off or whatever. And no, you, they're they have very well, that's not a requirement. It's, absolutely. Yeah, it's not a requirement, so yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, Jane, I wanna ask you a question. Uh, you know, one of the, the requirements for voting in Indiana is that you not currently be in prison. Do you wanna tell folks a little bit about the work that the ACLU is doing right now um, regarding um, eligibility of returning citizens to vote? Yeah, so thank you for asking this because it's a per personal passion of mine. I too get sad around election time. 
Um, and what does it for me is when people have um, self disenfranchised, mm -hmm. when they feel they believe they can't vote because they have um, been to, to prison or they have a, 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 a conviction on their record. Now, I want to be very, very clear about the what the law is in Indiana, and then I'm going to give some examples of what it's not. So in Indiana, as long as you are not in prison after being convicted of, a, of an offense, you can vote. So if you're in jail and you haven't been adjudicated, you haven't been judged guilty, you can vote. You can ask for a um, uh, if you're registered, you can ask to re be registered. If you're registered, you can ask for a ballot. Um, after you're released from, um, from jail or prison, you can vote regardless of whether you have fines and fees, regardless of your offense, um, despite the fact that you have your have an ankle bracelet, that you have work release, as long as you are not incarcerated, you can vote. I'm really clear about that because I've we now one of the reasons we took up this campaign at the ACLU is that um, in other states we've worked so hard to change the laws so that people who have some form of conviction um, on their records can vote. And um, in Indiana, we're one of 16 states where as soon as you're no longer incarcerated, you can vote. And yet so many people um, don't vote because they can't, they believe they can't. Not only that, so many people of in, in, uh, in positions of authority misinform individuals. We've heard stories of judges from the bench tell people the wrong thing. We've heard pro parole or probation officers tell people the wrong thing. Um, we just want to make sure that everyone knows and everyone tells their loved ones um, that as, if you're not incarcerated, you have the right to vote. So we really push people to register before the registration deadline this year. We'll continue to push people to register so that they, their voices can be heard. And you know, as this summer, just at, while I'm on my soapbox, I just want to point out one other issue, which is that you know we often have people respond, "Well, it does my vote is not going to matter, right? Why should I vote?" Um, and the 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 um, Everyone in the streets this summer asking, demanding racial justice, demanding um, an end to police brutality, an end to policing um, uh, that brutalizes um, communities of color. Um, that's why you need to vote because people who have been formally incarcerated, they have firsthand knowledge and they're in the best position to judge elected officials who, and candidates who can be elected officials to help change those laws and policies that have perpetuated a, a racist system. So um, if you want a reason to vote, it's because your voice is in, incredibly informed on these incredibly important issues. And, um, and yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> so vote, you've got your right <laughs> to vote, your voice, you can do it, use it. This is Catherine, if I may add quickly to Jane's comment. I am constantly reminding my community, uh, my disability community, when I'm giving training, voting is another form of self-advocacy. And it is a way for us to say, to indicate what we need for our communities. So the vote is very much integrated and connected to everything that we're given here in this country. The vote is connected to your job. Voting is connected to your health care. It is related to everything. Taxes. It, accessibility. So I can't, I can't even cite everything that voting is related to. It is the core of everything that we do. And so it is quite important that everyone, including people with disabilities, vote. Absolutely. Um, and Catherine, the next question is for you. What do you most want voters with disabilities to understand in terms of the assistance they can ask for? Because voters are allowed to ask for assistance. Thank you. 
Thank you. Anyone, including a voter with a disability, has the right to ask for assistance while voting. Now, if you go to a polling site, there are two ways that you can ask for assistance. One is that the voter can bring his or her uh, friend or parent or trusted other trusted individual, except for a boss or union representative. So those two people, those two people would not be allowed, but it could be any trusted individual outside of those two roles. You can bring that person with you, or you may ask a poll worker for assistance with the polling, with the voting booth. Now, that request does have to be made before entrant, entering into the booth. And the kind of help you can ask for is if you need a chair, if you need tape to uh, make some notes or a post-it note, if you need uh, magnifying glass for vision impairments. And when you ask for that assistance in the polling, at the polling site, there are typically then two poll workers from each party or other organization who will then come to assist you. Now they cannot influence the vote. They are simply there to provide the assistance that you have specifically requested. And I actually, I'm gonna do another screen share. I'd like to share a video that Indiana Disability Rights uh, the organization that Catherine is with um, has put out. Hopefully it works. Hi, I'm Dan, an Indiana voter. My vote. Try it again. Hi, I'm Dan, an Indiana voter. My vote is my voice. So when I go to the polls, I make sure I know exactly what my rights are. As a voter, you can expect your polling place to be accessible. This means accessible parking spaces, ramps, or other assistance for entrances with steps and accessible doors. If the main entrance is not an accessible entrance, signs should point to one. Paths from the parking lot to the entrance and from the entrance to the voting area should be clear and free of clutter. If you have any trouble getting around, you can always ask workers at the polls for help. You can also bring a friend or family member along to help. Once you've reached the polls, you can request to use an accessible voting machine. These can be easily moved and adjusted or even placed on a person's lap. There are also attachments to help those who are blind or who have limited vision. It's your right to vote. Don't give it up. If you have any trouble voting, you can call Indiana Disability Rights at 800-622-4845. We're here to help. I'm also going to share um, yeah. a video. I, may yeah, I add one thing, Erin? Yeah, yeah, we do have a hotline on election day. So the phone number that was cited on the video is the hotline that, you're, that you can call on election day. And we do have staff and attorneys on site on the hotline available to help any voter who with a disability if there are any issues or problems related to casting a vote. Great, great. I'm also very quickly going to show a video that the ACLU has put together regarding returning citizens and their right to vote. Um, as I think some, actually we've had some questions I believe pop up in the chat that the video will answer. So I definitely wanna make an effort to share, um, share that. Look, I've been to prison. Am I allowed to vote? Let's clear this up. In Indiana, voting rights are automatically restored upon release from jail or prison. If you're on parole, probation, home detention, or you're in jail waiting trial, yes, you can vote. The right to vote is your chance to be a bigger part of your community, a chance to make your voice heard. Own your power and exercise your right to vote this November. And I also wanted to share those videos because that stuff makes wonderful social media content that everyone watching can help reshare and to help get these messages out there. Because again, if we're working to combat some of the fear and anxiety and some of the self disenfranchisement that was talked about, sharing this information um, can really be useful. Uh, I also very quickly, one of our speakers tonight, as some of you have probably noticed, uh, Carla Lopez Owens was unable to join us. She had a work emergency. Uh, 
but I want, but Carla graciously emailed back and forth with me today. Uh, and I wanted to get some of her, wanted to make sure we included some of her insights into this conversation. So I had asked her as a naturalized citizen herself, she's originally from Mexico, but what are some of the obstacles that she sees in terms of voting and um, immigrant communities, um, new citizen communities? And one of the things that, that she brought up, and I think Catherine, this applies to voters with disabilities as well, is that part of the voting process when you are asking for assistance is that you will need to complete an affidavit of voter assistance. Um, and sometimes it can be scary to be told you have to fill out another form when you're going to go and vote, but this is a part of the process. If you do need to ask for assistance at the polls and you can ask for language assistance, this is what Carla was bringing up. If you um, are not proficient in English, you can bring a friend, a family member, um, what, someone else, someone who's bilingual to help you with that. You just have to ask for that assistance when you check in at the polls and you will have to fill out an affidavit of voter assistance. But that affidavit is, is not scary. It is a part of the process. Um, it's a fairly simple form, but it will be something you'll have to complete. Uh, Carl also just wanted to state that it's, it's been her experience that for those um, whose English, it, it's, English is not their first language, sometimes they lack a confidence to vote on their own. Um, and due to the history of immigration in the United States and the current climate, um, and those coming from underrepresented, uh, underrepresented communities, um, such as Latino and other immigrant communities, there's a distrust that's happening with the government. Um, and this means sometimes they're less likely to ask for clarification so they will go to someone who has participated in the process, but that person may be you know, an unofficial authority who doesn't always have the, the right answer. Um, so what she feels is that um, she would really like for those for whom English is a second language to know that it's okay for them to ask to have help at the polls and to bring someone with them that can help them navigate the process and navigate um, the ballot. And that's, that's just, it's absolutely their right to do that. All right, so um, now I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of having a voting plan, which is something that Jane had brought up earlier. So for step one for having a voting plan is being registered to vote, um, but Indiana's voter reg registration deadline has passed. That was October 5th. Um, but I think Autumn brought this up too. Anytime, just to reinforce this message, anytime you move or change your name, you do need to update your voter registration. Um, and it's, it is important to also, although not technically required in all instances, it is a really brilliant idea to update your identification as well, because it's just gonna make life easier for you at the polls, the, the more consistency that is found between the voter registration and your ID. But what happens? If you have moved or changed your name after October 5th, then what do you do? I'm gonna launch another quick poll here for our audience. And what I would love for you, the audience to tell us, if you have moved, oh, my grammar is terrible there, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. If you have moved or changed your name after the voter registration deadline closed, can you vote? Yes, no, or maybe. All right, we'll give it just a few more seconds here, let a few more folks get their votes in. All right, I'm gonna end the polling, share the results here. So 82% uh, of you said yes, and 18% said maybe. The answer is a little tricky, actually. Um, in many cases, yes, but not necessarily. So maybe is the, the best answer to give there. And I just wanna to toss this out to any of the panelists who would like to respond. Um, and this is in the Indiana Voter Bill of Rights that everybody can refer back to later at the end of the event. But can you talk to us a little bit about some of the fail-safe procedures that exist for voters who fall into this category of having moved um, after the voter registration deadline? I would probably say to bring a, uh, like a piece of mail from your current address to, um, to basically show that you live in that area. Um, I think it's a lot easier now that we have um, a satellite site, so we really don't have to worry about um, like different precincts, which is amazing. 
Um, but prior to that, you did have to vote in your precinct. And I would always, always advise bringing a piece of mail from your current address with your name on it to match your ID. Anyone else want to share anything about fail safes? So the only thing I'll bring up is I hope voters know that I want voters watching tonight to, to know this term, a fail safe. Um, this is one of the things you can advocate for when you go to the polls. If you have recently moved, you can ask the poll workers to check the fail safes. Um, there's a whole list of them, kind of, if this, then that, if this, then that, that helps the poll workers understand who is eligible to vote, even though they have moved, um, and just what the parameters around that are. There are also fail-safe procedures in place for if you go to vote and your name isn't on the poll list, but you've got a voter registration card that was sent to you and you can prove that you're registered to vote, um, poll workers can issue something called a certificate of error. That's another fail safe that exists. So again, we encourage you to check out your voter bill of rights and to look at those fail safes and to understand the options you have if you do fall in this category of someone who has moved after the registration period or because you registered late to, or close to the registration period and maybe there's some sort of you know, mess up and your name isn't appearing in the poll book. Um, just don't automatically assume that you can't vote ask the poll workers to, to check those fail safes and to help you navigate this system. Um, you're, again, we're gonna say this several times, you have the right to ask the poll workers to assist you to the fullest degree possible. Um, but of course, in some situations, the issue arises that the poll workers can't help you, um, that your name legitimately isn't on, you know, in the poll book um, or, or something else has happened and a provisional ballot has to be issued. Now at the League of Women Voters, we refer to the provisional ballot as a, ba a ballot as a ballot of last resort. Um, so can some, some of you guys, I'll let anyone who chime in who wants to um, maybe explain to the audience what a provisional ballot is and what the voters responsibility is after they have cast a provisional ballot. Yeah, this is Catherine, I'd like to speak to that. So a provisional ballot is is used when there's a severe issue with the voting procedure or registration. As Aaron just mentioned, maybe the voter's name is really not in the rolls, or if, for example, the voting process is, you feel is challenged for any reason, you need to challenge the voting process that you just experienced. You can request a provisional ballot, but a provisional ballot is not actually, in and of itself, a ballot that will be counted. So with that, you take that form and then you have a certain number of days to repair the issue. And I think it's a 10 days and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a 10 day period after election day to fix that issue. So it does need immediate attention and you cannot delay because if you don't fix the issue that you faced, then your vote certainly is not counted. And I would say to follow up with the, um, the election board after to make sure that your vote was counted. And if they say no, you can actually ask them why it was not counted. Sorry, this is Autumn. Yeah. So. No, these are, thank you. Um, these are great points. I think there's a lot of confusion out there about provisional ballots and what they actually mean. So I appreciate you guys explaining this to people. Um, yes, and this, this is Catherine again, if I may chime in. I do want to mention, and this, this may be a little bit off topic with the provisional ballots, but I think um, that absentee ballots, a, there was a judge that just decided to, it, oh, that if your signature did not match the registration card, your, your ballot would not be counted. But I think it's recently been declared that judges, a judge has decided that you must allow voters to continue to vote even if the exact signature does not match and give them the opportunity to fix that issue. And I might stand corrected on that, but that is one important change and that is one thing voters should know. If they contact their election board and there's an issue with the actual signature, 
they and that's indicated they should go to their election board and fix that immediately and not wait to fix that because again your vote may not be considered no thank you for bringing that up um, i actually did want to talk about the absentee by mail balloting process and uh and some of what's going on around that because my goodness at, Vote by mail has been in the news nonstop, really since May, right? Since we postponed the primary. And the information is ping-ponging back and forth and seems to be changing because there are many legal um, lawsuits that are being filed. Um, but Catherine, the, the case you just mentioned, yeah, the US um, Southern District Court, I'm looking at the other lawyers on here, make sure I get this right. Um, the US Southern District Court, just uh, Judge Sarah Evans Barker did issue uh, an opinion that the current law is if a voter's on election day processing the absentee by mail ballots, if there's a signature mismatch, that ballot is put aside and the voter can correct it, but there's no, no requirement requiring the poll worker, requiring the election officials to contact the voter to tell them there was a problem with the ballot. So now, because of this order by Judge Barker, I believe election officials do have to contact the voter to tell them that there was a signature problem, their ballot was not counted, and they've got to put forth the effort then to go and have the, the ballot counted. And I'm going to look at Jane and Autumn and make sure I got that right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So important information um, to have. But it goes back to that idea, even with the provisional ballot, that it does fall on the voter to do some follow-up work to um, make sure that their, their ballot is counted. Um, but a little bit more about absentee ballots here. Um, let me see here. What, what are you guys in, in the respective um, roles that you have professionally and in your volunteer life, um, start talking about to people that you're working with in terms of the absentee ballots and voting by mail. What, what's some advice you wanna give people or what are some concerns that you have about voting by mail? And Autumn, I'm gonna start with you if I can. Sure, absolutely. So I would say I'm um, letting people know to go ahead and get it in before the deadline, um, just so there's no confusion about whether they received it and to also call and make sure that their ballot was received. You can call and make sure that it was received. So I always communicate that as well. And I know it kind of defeats the purpose of um, the whole absentee, but if you can drop it off at the actual location, you can do that as well to make sure that you're that you know that your ballot made it to um, the, the site versus sending it through the mail. Yeah. Um, and another great resource to track your ballot is IndianaVoters.com. Of course, not everybody has internet access, but um, yeah, the calling and, and tracking it that way. Jane, is there anything in particular that? Um, you think folks should consider or know about when it comes oh. to vote by mail? Sorry, this is Catherine. Yeah, I've been trying to I chime in. I wanted to interrupt, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I wanted to just interject something. Go ahead. In regards to absentee ballots, uh, you really need to make sure that they're following the instructions on what's being said. Because if it says use a black pen or use a pencil or whatever it says, you need to follow exactly what it says. Make sure that all of the instructions are being read and that they're following them in order. And that the, because there should be cards and they, they should have to have the initials that, that need to be placed on the cards. And if you only have one initial or the other initial, so what you need to do is really contact the county clerk and ask for a replacement. You, you do have the right for that. Mm -hmm. And make sure that you do sign the ballot because a lot of times the absentee ballots, they're tossed out because people are not following the directions or not signing them. Or you know maybe they only have one or two of the initials and so they really need to make sure that they are reading the instructions very carefully and making sure that everything is in order and that it looks good. And that if they have any problems, they can call the county clerk's office or call the board. No, that's excellent, excellent advice about following the directions thoroughly because many times, yeah, absentee ballots, if they get rejected, um, it's because they, yeah, they're, 
the instructions weren't followed. I um, personally, a few years back was working an election day and I actually had an elderly couple down the street who randomly was the one who processed their mail-in ballot. They had requested it by mail, but each of them had, they returned both the ballots in one envelope. And you can't do that. You have to return your ballot in the envelope that was assigned to it. Um, I was able, because I knew them, I was able to walk down the street and tell them about it. But yeah, follow those directions um, thoroughly. Um, is there anything else anyone would like to share? Jane, anything you'd like to share about absentee by mail? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I mean, these are all great points. It, it on the larger picture, it points to why um, we as, as voters need to advocate now, but more importantly now that, that it's so close to the election, after the election, for some changes to our laws governing our elections, because it shouldn't be that it's so complicated and making one little mistake costs you your vote, which in a democracy is so, so vital. Um, and the Judge Barker's decision about um, the, the, um, the matching signature, her solution, which has been a solution of many um, courts when, chat, when these laws have been successfully, various parts of these rules have been successfully challenged is to say, um, you need to give the, the voter the, op, the opportunity to repair the mistake, right? Um, to come in, um, but as you pointed out, Aaron, that right now that notice isn't required to be given in most instances, whether it's the signature, the initials, or the, you know, different states have different envelopes, and I mean, it's very confusing and it's ridiculous that it uh, all those barriers um, block our vote. So. Um, Advocate after the election, advocate with your elected officials to make voting um, secure, absolutely, but it can be so much simpler than it is now. I want to point out one of the ways that our law could be simpler in Indiana, and many of us um, advocated for the deadline for when the ballot, absentee ballot, is received back in the mail by um, the uh, elected officials, election officials. Um, Indiana law requires that it be received by noon on election day, which, you know, tell that to your mailman, right? Um, so it's an arbitrary deadline and it was challenged. The lower court um, agreed that it was an, a, an arbitrary deadline, but unfortunately the court of appeals in the seventh circuit has reinstated the law. So Every vote, our advice, and I think advice of most advocates is, regardless of what might happen between now and the election, assume that your ballot must be received by the elected election officials by noon on election day. So if you have to mail it, that means fill it out now, mail it now, get it there. If it, um, as, as Autumn um, rightly suggested, if you can, if, if it's, um, how, according to your county's um, requirements, deliver it in hand, by hand um, so that you know that it's in the hands of election officials well before that deadline. Um, and again, after the election, after we have um, all new freshly elected, elected officials, advocate to them to change the law so that um, it's a reasonable amount of time for a ballot that was put into the mail um, is delivered to the, and it's uh, accounted so that your voice is heard. Yeah. No, thank you. We, um, I often like to point out that systems work as they were designed to work, in, you know, and um, Indiana, according to the, uh, our public health, our, our, our civic health index in 2016, we were 41st in the nation in voter turnout. Now you can either tell me people don't care or we've maybe developed a system that simply does not encourage people to vote and makes it harder on people to vote. Um, so yeah, that's, you're singing to my heart there, Jane, and the idea like after the election, you're, yeah, that's the time, please start engaging these newly elected leaders about, or elected officials about changing some of these laws because it shouldn't be this hard in a democracy to practice democracy. Um, 
So let's talk now though a little bit about early in-person voting because this is another option that voters have and we want to make sure that voters understand that option and understand their rights um, around that. Um, so same question really that I just asked you about vote by mail but voting in person. What are some things that you really want voters to know about voting in person and how to um, advocate for themselves when they go to vote for the polls, um, go to vote early? This is open to anyone. I'll, this is Jane. Um, I'll just jump in and sorry, but setting up in contrast to absentee voting, which is that um, you can um, vote early for any reason. Absentee voting, again, in Indiana, unfortunately, you have to have one of the five or six listed reasons. But in Indiana, um, if you want to vote early at one of the vote, early voting sites, you can. You don't need a reason. Anyone else want to share anything about early voting? Some advice you'd like to give voters about the process? Catherine? Yes, this is Catherine. Okay, in regards to voting, you have to make sure that you have a, a plan. You need, to, you need to know where your voting site is. Um, dress accordingly uh, for the weather because the line may be very long. I'll bring some water. And if you may need some help, you know, if you have some physical disabilities where you're not able to stand for long periods of time, you might be able to ask the poll workers to bring out a chair for you to be able to sit while you're waiting. Um, I'm trying to think of anything. Um, if I think of something, I'll bring it up. Thanks. No, this is all good advice. Like you're allowed to take these things with you, particularly if you uh, believe that there's going to be a long line um, and it's going to be a, a busy day and a process. Um, I'm going to ask um, those of you on that, whoever wants to answer this, I know the answer, but can you take an aid with you into the polling booth to help you cast your ballot? Catherine's yes. nodding yes vigorously, so we're yes. gonna go with Catherine. <laughs> yes, she can, because that's part of your right. You are able to have somebody come in with you, and but you need to make sure that it's not your boss. Uh, you can't not be a union rep, representative, rep, I'm sorry, union rep. Uh, it, it could be like an SSP, a service provider for a person who is deaf blind, or a nurse or a caretaker, uh, that kind of person could come in. Um, you are also allowed to take in um, sample ballots with you to vote. You can take in, you know, if you, if you need to take in a note with a list of names, you can do that. Um, Jane, I believe we now, thanks to the ACLU, can take our electronic devices into the polling booth. Is that correct? You absolutely can. And not only that, is that you can take a picture of you with your ballot in the voting booth. Yeah. Um, they're called ballot selfies, and it's part of your um, uh, freedom of speech, and you can use it to encourage others to vote um, by showing that you, you voted. Uh, uh, and, and just as, as a further encouragement, um, uh, yesterday, my 94-year-old um, mother stood in line with her walker, but uh, stood in line for an hour to vote in um, Monroe County. So um, I believe that if she can do it, then um, everybody can find a way um, and find the accommodation that helps make sure that they can um, have their voices heard. All right. So we've talked a little bit about the ID that you need to take with you. We okay. have talked- Congratulations oh, to your yes. mother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and also, also, one thing I did want to add to that, in regards to pe voting with people who, who have disabilities or walkers or things like that, if you encounter any kind of problems where it may not be disability uh, accessible, maybe it's that they don't have a ramp or the door is too small to get through, I really encourage the people to contact us at the Indiana Disability Rights Office. And that way we would be able to help them to resolve those issues because they need to be able to have all of those voting precincts are supposed to be accessible. 
during the early voting and on election day. So they are supposed to have that. That is what the law says. I appreciate that. Um, while I ask this next question, I'm gonna share a screen with everybody just to um, make sure we have a chance to look at it. Okay, so we have talked about the, um, the need for proper ID. Um, we've talked about the fact that there are fail safes that allow voters, sorry, this is my fault. I put a, a PowerPoint slide on an automatic timer and it's not gonna stay on the slide I want. But we've talked about ID, we've talked about voters having a fail safe procedure to, to vote their old precinct one last time if they moved. Um, we have talked about provisional ballots. We've talked about the different ways of voting. Okay, so we're getting our plan together. We know some of our rights when we go to the polls. I wanna preface this by saying that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. We never endorse or oppose any candidates. We never have, we never will. It is not partisan of me to point out facts, however, um, and that there have been, unfortunately, many Republican leaders at the national stage who have made strong calls for poll watchers and others to show up to, at the polls on election day and to monitor the situation. Um, to be clear, a poll watcher is an official term. Poll watchers are a part of the process. Poll watchers have to be credentialed and poll watchers have to understand the laws of their state and what their role can be. It can't just be anybody walking in there to, to take a look around. Um, but unfortunately we know people are going a little far and we've had some incidences in Virginia and Pennsylvania and other where other other areas where early voting has begun, and there have been episodes of voter harassment and intimidation. Um, so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about um, if anyone is seeing any sort of voter intimidation, um, harassment happening here, or hearing of anything that that we need that we need others to to be aware of. I don't know, Autumn, Jane, I'm sorry. Yeah, I haven't Autumn, heard anything um, personally. I know that it does take place. It happened to me, I wanna say in the 20, I'm oh, sorry, the 2008 election. Um, so I have personally experienced that at one point in time in my lifetime, unfortunately. Um, there are um, election protection lines that you can call. Um, one that I always give out is the 1866 um, our vote number. Um, you can also contact the US Department of Justice for voting rights. Um, and they have a 1-800 number as well, or you can also contact the Marion County Clerk's Office to, um, to basically let them know what is going on as far as intim voter intimidation. So I just put that slide up again, give everybody a couple of seconds here to take a look at that, maybe record some of these numbers. I will say though, anyone who um, signed up for this via Zoom, if we have your email address, I will email everyone who signed up a PDF of this PowerPoint presentation so you can capture some of the information there. Um, and if you're watching this on Facebook, it'll record and you can go back and uh, capture the information or contact the League of Women Voters. We're happy to follow up with anybody um, with some of the specifics here. I think Rhea has diligently been trying to add things to the chat um, feature as well. But yes, um, that one our vote the election protection hotline um, is an excellent tool there. So go ahead, Aaron, can I yeah, I just, this is Jane. I just want to jump in on a couple of thoughts. I mean, first and foremost, rhetoric, um, irresponsible talk by our elected officials is not the same thing as um, uh, actually being in fear, fear for um, your safety at the at polls. Every indication thus far is that it's safe to vote and that you need to vote. If you are apprehensive about what happens, might, what might happen on election day, you don't want to wait that long. Then please, you know, make your plan to vote early. Um, they're gonna, there are going to be um, options in a couple of counties, including Marion County, um, for you to sign up and and get information about where, um, what are wait lines, what are wait times, um, and you know, polls, particular um, polling sites that might be more advantageous to visit. You know, what we're telling um, our, our um, people who contact us um, is a couple of things. First of all, just be mindful that um, anything that you hear, it might be coming from another state and know that um, all the um, state laws vary from state to state. So there are states, not ours, but there are other states where 
Um, you can go into the polls. You don't have to be a credentialed poll walker, but poll watcher. But you know, make sure that you you know and understand that in Indiana, it's only going to be credentialed people who are allowed into the polling site. The only other people besides elected election officials that are allowed in polling sites and in the chute, that the the fifty feet um, between the entrance to the polling site, um, outside of the entrance to the polling site. Um, are people who are voting and people who are assisting people who are voting. No one else should be in that. And you can ask an election official to ask somebody to leave if you think they're, they're not allowed to be there. Um, outside of the shoot, people have a free speech rights. And you know, we're encouraging people to, to stay in line. If you, if you feel unsafe, let an election official know. But know that um, you know, it's mostly, to not let um, words um, drive you away from exercising your right to vote. And, um, and if you feel you're any kind of safety, again, tell an election official um, to assist you. Um, we wanna make sure that people stay in line and that they um, vote. And, and just one of their sort of related, uh, there have been um, questions that we have gotten, perhaps others have gotten about, what is electioneering and who can, um, you know, maybe uh, in some states, um, you know, we've heard stories of people being asked to leave when maybe what they were wearing um, wasn't um, a, an express violation of the law. In Indiana, electioneering is when you are visibly showing um, an image or a name of a candidate or a political party. Um, we're encouraging people, um, if you are approached by election, an election official who claims that something on you is electioneering, please stay in line, please vote, you know, cover it up, whatever they find offensive. If you think they did it um, incorrectly, if they're interpreting the law incorrectly, fight that battle another day. Contact us or whoever. Um, but most importantly, comply get your vote down and, and um, fight that fight later. Catherine, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, I did. I would like to add to what Jane is talking about, about the, the shoot, the 50 feet of um, distance outside of the polling uh, precinct. If people are intimidating you in any way as you are standing online, and that and you feel it's severe enough that you are fearful you also have the right to call the police i believe that in indiana law and correct me if i'm wrong that voter intimidation is against the law mm -hmm. so they are allowed also you are allowed also to call the police if you feel that it's reached that level The voter intimidation is against the law. Autumn, is there anything else you'd like to add to this conver this part of the conversation? Um, no, I just think it's a great point that um, Catherine and both Jane brought up about Jane bringing up the point that you can't wear a candidate's name into the um, into the polling sites. I always tell people to turn your turn it inside out. Um, if you need to go back to your car and do that and have somebody hold your spot in line, then. Like she said, just go ahead and make sure you get your, your vote casted and then take care of that afterwards. Yeah, it's actually casting the ballot. That's the important part. Then go, you know, run around with your, your candidate information right. on afterwards. Just, Absolutely. You know, yeah. <laughs> so this also leads to a conversation about how what we can do to help um, mitigate against misinformation going around out there. I mean, Jane pointed to the fact that, you know, Okay, elections, part of the reason elections are confusing is because all 50 states have different laws. All the counties in those 50 states have different sort of administrative procedures for how they execute those laws. And then you add on top of that, um, you know, fake news and other kinds of, of you know, um, sensationalistic conspiracy theory based information coming out there. It's, it gets confusing. So from all of you, maybe you could just share with the audience some key resources or tools that you use to um, combat misinformation in your own lives, because we're all getting inundated with it. 
I would say something as simple as Googling it um, and finding a reliable source to fact check what I'm reading. Um, I know sometimes with some, I would say, I wanna say it was Facebook, they just put in place um, a fact checker to basically call out the things that are not um, correct and to um, stop misinformation. I think they're actually doing that on all platforms because it's actually kind of ran, unfortunately ran rampant um, with this current election cycle. Um, so I definitely would say do your own research and find reliable sources that do line up or are close to what um, the most reliable information is. Jane, what Aaron, about you? This is, this is um, Jane, and um, I would I, I totally agree with Autumn. What you know, what makes this election so anxiety packed is that it's anxiety on top of anxiety, right? I mean, this has been. Um, a number of years uh, where people have felt anxious, anxious for themselves, anxious for their neighbors. Um, and what we've, what advice I've given from the beginning is um, find a trusted um, source of information. That could be the ACLU, it could be the League of Women Voters, it could be a um, trusted news site um, and, um, and take, and see what advice they're presenting. So for instance, the ACLU, we've in these past, past month have been trying to build out our website information so that we direct them to advocacy groups, um, some of which are on this call today, who we know are, are, is, uh, they're offering reliable information depending on a specific question. We direct them to their county clerks, et cetera. So, you know, um, whatever source you trust, uh, we recommend that you go to that source and see where that leads you so that you make sure that the train thread of information you're following is a, is a reliable one. Catherine? Yes. Our agency, Indiana Disability Rights, does have a website um, as well called hoosiersvote.org and there is also a lot of information there and it's plenty there are plenty of resources we also promulgate information on our social media sites and in addition to that we use politifact.com which is a website that is neutral and gives information and also indicates whether or not the news is true or not. There's another site called Ballotpedia. If you'd like to research your candidates, you can use that website. And it is uh, similar to what Autumn and Jane said. Just Google, use different sources, fact check, uh, county clerk, election board. You can ask, um, your closest friends that you trust what what you're for information that you may be struggling with especially if you have barriers to language ask a trusted friend or family member to help you out as well so there are plenty of sources out there it's not you it is not acceptable uh, don't accept information at face value make sure you vet the information you're getting because that information affects our democratic process and it is our right to question how things are. Right. And that is, why, that is why we take to the voting booth. Yep. If you don't take things at face value, we, we vote because we want better for our communities. No, absolutely. Say it again. We are allowed to question <laughs> our authority figures and power structures in, this, in the whole system. Uh, and also, just I would remind everybody out there that words on top of a pretty image, memes are not necessarily true. Um, and even if they are memes that validate your underlying beliefs, be careful what you're, sh what you're sharing. Um, because a lot of these things that are being created, uh, they're actually, it's, it's been documented, they're being created by third parties outside of this country. And they are aimed simply at trying to ratchet up our emotions and make us more anxiety prone and, and more worried and, and more fearsome. So just be very, very careful about automatically hitting that share button and, and sharing some of this stuff. 
I think that's a great point to um, voter education, just making sure that it's, it's your responsibility to be educated before you step into the booth. Just making sure you do the research on your candidates um, to piggyback off the, of the question that you asked initially. But I think it's voter education that is the ultimate responsibility of the voter. Yeah, no, yeah, it, yeah. Um, and I just, a few sites, um, Catherine mentioned Ballot, Ballotopedia, which is a very good site. Um, I use PolitiFact myself to fact check things. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, but I also wanna recommend to everyone vote411.org, which hopefully Rhea will put in the chat here. Um, that is the League of Women Voters Candidate Guide. You can actually use vote411.org to find your way into other um, websites that will help you verify your voter registration, track your absentee ballot, um, and find voting locations for you. So vote411.org is something, of course, I'm going to recommend to you. But I am also going to highly recommend at this stage in the process, the Marion County Election Board's website, uh, which is vote.nd.gov. Um, I think you can also get to it if you go to votend.org. Um, but, but these are some really good websites to go to right now for just their basic nonpartisan civic education that you need. So as Autumn said, when you step into the polls, you're, you're you know, armed with the, the resources um, that, that are really, really good for you. Um, we're getting towards the end here. So I want to, and I'm gonna, before we end, just I'm gonna share a slide with everybody on some ways that you can get involved this um, election day if you wanna find some way to volunteer and be a part of the process. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to get your guys' take on this. I mean, we've talked about a lot of heavy stuff and it's, it's important that we, we acknowledge, I think the anxiety that exists right now, but it's also important that we take ownership of this process um, and that we go out there and vote. So what are some like final <laughs> words of hope or inspiration that you wanna give our viewers or what's giving you, if not hope in the system right now, hope, in some of the, hope from some of the people that are, are involved in this year's election? Autumn, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> sure. I definitely would say to just make sure you don't let and you don't let anxiety or fear take you over. Um, it's so easy, especially with this current um, election cycle. I think a lot of people get into their own heads, um, and then we have COVID on top of that. So um, I know that has been a huge um, turning point in a lot of people's mental health as far as just anxiety and fear. Um, so I would just definitely say to um, Make a plan to make sure, I know Catherine has touched on this several times, just to make a plan, make sure that you and Jane as well, make sure you have a plan in place. Um, and if you need any type of um, help or resources, don't be afraid to ask or don't feel like you are um, silly for asking questions because I mean, just from watching the numbers, we have a lot of first time voters. Um, and to me, don't um, shame voters who are voting for the first time instead of, instead of that, encourage them and see if there's others who would like to join them or even make it into like a, like a fun activity for friends and family. I know I got my sister to vote for the first time by making it into a, um, this last election cycle, um, making it into like a, a girl's day. I'm like, we're going voting first and after that we can go, we can go to brunch. So um, just planning activities around it, but also having a plan in place. Um, and again, not shaming first time voters, but instead encouraging them and helping them through the process because like we've all um, said, this is not an easy process, unfortunately. Um, so anything we can do to help people who need the resources, please do it. Well, that's great advice. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, like, absolutely. Shaming doesn't work at all. Oh, so that's not. wonderful advice. Jane or Catherine, is there any like parting words, words of inspiration or hope or whatever you want to give people? Yeah, um, but I would love to. I know that everyone is, as Autumn said, feeling some sense of anxiety, but we are not lost. All is not lost. We still have a democracy. We still can show up and vote. And I think it's critically important that when you vote, you realize that that is a form of self-care. So try to reduce your uh, news watching, perhaps, and focus more on yourself and focus more on who you really feel you'd like to vote for that matches your uh, beliefs about the system, your values, your community's needs. 
and then your vote, of course, still counts. It does still count, and it is a form of self-advocacy, like I said. So it doesn't matter, no matter if someone says to you, you know, your vote really is worthless, it doesn't really matter, it does. This is how we get to where we are now. It's been so many years of our fight for our rights in this country to vote that has led us to where we are today. So think about that. So many people have fought for us to be where we are. So we certainly shouldn't take anything for granted about election day. Take, taking for granted the right to vote is really not what we should do. We should really value that right. So I encourage you to get out there, to cast your vote. And if you feel anxious or you're uncertain what to do or you're having issues, Never be afraid to call all of the hotlines available to you, including ours at Indiana Disability Resources. Ask questions. We're happy to help you through the process. Thank you. Jane, how about you? You're not yeah, alone. I agree with what both um, Autumn and Catherine said. I, I guess I would say, sum it up with, from my perspective in three ways. One, I think voting is an act of courage. And it's, you know, we often in America look to other countries and about how people, um, you know, overcome such obstacles, stand in line sometimes for days to vote. Um, but it's also can be for some people, shamefully in our country, um, an act of courage to vote, whether they feel like no one, um, they're not welcome in the, in the um, voting place, they, we have had a, a history across the country in every state of laws that were meant to disenfranchise people because of who they were, whether it's because of their race um, or other aspects of, who, of their identity. Um, and so for, 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 I think we should assume that for every person, it's an act of courage. I also think that it's an act of hope, right? And we vote because we think it's going to matter. We vote because um, we want, we believe in the future and we believe that um, our vote will have an impact on that future that we um, want. So it's an act of, of hope, which um, we all know over the last um, year has been a particular tool of getting through every day, let alone um, these past years. And then fact, Finally, it's an act of power, right? I mean, it's, it's an incredible um, uh, right that we each have. And so, you know, if, if um, there are so many ways where um, our, um, our ability to affect um, might be limited, but here our power is equal to every other um, person's power. And so, um, it's an act of courage, an act of hope, and an act of power. And, um, you know, like every superhero that you might admire, you know, if you got the power, you got to use it, use it for good. There you go. Um, and some of you guys, that's actually a great way to end. Great segue, Jane. <laughs> some of you on election day might want to use your citizen power, um, not only by casting a ballot, but by getting out there and helping to protect um, the rights of others. So I wanted to close by sharing um, a screen with some options that some of you are watching might want to consider. Um, first and foremost, serving as a poll worker is a wonderful way to help people vote, right? That's the job of a poll worker. Now in Marion County, um, those positions are filled. We actually did a Zoom two or three weeks ago with Clerk Myla Eldridge. Um, we had, there were more than 4,000 people who contacted the election board to work on this um, election day. Uh, that is, I think, like double the number they need. So right now, if you're trying to find out how to be a poll worker, those positions are filled. Um, I think the site doesn't even have, list any more trainings on there. But I know it's a presidential election year, but other elections will be coming up every year. Next year, 2021, thank God, is an off year. But beginning in 2022, you know, we'll need poll workers then. So consider being a poll worker. But for this election um, season, if you're comfortable doing so, you can um, go to a group called Go Vote Indy. They're another nonpartisan organization that the League of Women Voters has been partnering with. They are offering rides 
to the polls um, during early voting and on election day. And they need volunteer drivers to help people get to the polls. Um, if you are interested in um, the, the number that Autumn gave earlier, the, um, um, the 1-800-1866 hour vote, the election protection hotline, so election protection is actually this national grassroots organization that Common Cause in Indiana here works very closely with. Um, and they actually um, have volunteer positions open on election day to help monitor the polling places. Um, if you're not comfortable going out, there might be a role for you to help watchdog social media and to help combat misinformation. Um, and there's some other opportunities and you can learn more about that by going to protectvote.net. Um, and Jane alluded to this earlier. I'm really excited about this. Um, there's going to be a pilot project beginning October 24th through Election Day on November 3rd, and it's called Indie Vote Times. Wouldn't it be nice if before you go out to vote, early vote or go vote on Election Day, you could look up the polling place that you want to go to and see how long the lines are, because maybe that one isn't the most convenient one to go to. If you drive 20 minutes north, there's a three hour shorter wait. So. Vote Times is a collaborative effort between some, some groups here in town, and they are looking for volunteers who will volunteer during early voting at the satellite sites beginning October 24th through Election Day, who will log real-time information um, so that voters can go to a website, indievotetimes.org, and see what the wait times are. Um, so if you're interested in doing that on Election Day and helping to keep voters informed on Election Day on maybe the place with the shortest line, you can volunteer and the website is in the um, slide there. It's intechforprogress.org backslash election 2020. And then lastly, and this is only for League of Women um, voter members, but our national organization on October 29th at 3 p.m. is offering a webinar called Protecting Democracy Active Bystander Training. And this will be a webinar for League members um, on how to potentially diffuse um, contentious situations um, at, at the polls on election day. Um, and again, if you registered for this event through Zoom, I've got your email address. I'm gonna email all of this to you. Um, and we will go back onto the Facebook page and we will add some of this information into the comments so people can, um, can find it now. Um, but I wanna echo the remarks of Catherine, Jane and Autumn there, there is reason to hope because we still do have a democracy. We can still get involved um, and we can help each other. We can help lift each other up in this process if we're willing to um, not only know our own rights but stand up for the rights of others. And with that, I'm gonna, um, does anybody have any final words you would like to say before we log off for the evening? Vote. Okay, happy voting. <laughs> happy vote, happy, yeah. Catherine. Oh, yes. Election day lines might be very long and oh, election day lines might be very long, but you should know that even if it's about, if the polling site is about to close, you do not leave. If you are there before closing, you can still cast a vote. Even if, as long as you're online before they close, they are supposed to allow you to cast your vote. Yep, right. stay in line. Absolutely. All right, well, Jane, Autumn, Catherine, um, thank you so much for your time. I also wanna thank Christina and Lena for their interpretation. Thank you very much. Um, it was wonderful talking with you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with voters and everyone have a, a wonderful election day. Just make it great, go out there and um, yeah, cast that ballot. So thank you everybody. Thank you for having us.